Vale. Eh, first of all, English people. Yes. Okay. So. I get to speak in English. <laughs> and uh, no, don't, don't, don't be sorry. That, that, that's one of the things. It comes in the pack. So. Uh, okay. So. First of all, uh, I have to talk about DevOps, and and of course DevOps. Uh, I, I chose a, a slightly long uh, title for the talk. Uh, with an unintended pun, so uh, you know, you know Borat. So uh, don't worry, I won't do the talk with uh, with the Borat voice or with the Borat accent. So, Chen Kui. Um, and uh, please do remember that if uh, at the end of the talk there are some smiley faces and some crying faces. Uh, if you, if you, you don't uh, give me a good punctuation, I will be executed. <laughs> so so uh, let's see, DevOps. W what's it all about? And, uh, and uh, I, I want to take it on, uh, on another view, because people tend to obsess about talking about, oops, sorry, about tools. And uh, really, DevOps is an agile methodology Agile, if you read the Agile Manifesto, one of the first phrases in there is people over process over tools. So first you have to get comfortable and, and get, in, get the right people and then the, your processes, you need to know them and, and, and change them and then you find the tools to do it. So. I'm going to do a small stunt uh, for this uh, talk. I won't talk about, I'll talk about zero tools. I'm going to talk about people and processes. And uh, I don't want to make it too boring, so uh, really, really don't worry this will not be an ITIL foundation blah 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 processes blah 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 thing so uh, so uh, oh yeah and of course devops devops comes to comes to be a, a bit about communication uh, doing things in another manner and communicating uh, a bit more uh, that development and operations uh, for them not to be isolated silos. The first thing we have to do is to stop uh, to stop being uh, like this. So. See the shirt? Select star from users where clue bigger than zero, no results return. So ops people and dev people tend to be like that with their users. Ops people's users are development, development users are ops, and we treat each other like shit, so stop doing it. And for that, of course, we have to uh, change, change again, no? And we have to, we have to get a, a shirt, we, we have to get in the right mood, so. Big flashy shirt, development. I'm an ops guy. I embrace Java. Yay! So, after that, let's try to land stuff. So let's try to land concepts. This is just a slide with a. With, it's just an excuse to put a real neat concord on a presentation. So uh, first of all, uh, so I, I, I'm since I'm not talking about I've talked about uh, since I'm not going to talk about tools and I'm just going to be talking about first people things uh, things that people can adapt to and of course I'm I'm talking about DevOps in the context of the cloud 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 providers and especially public cloud maybe private cloud uh, the thing is that. Clouds, when, when you're thinking about going to the cloud or deploying in the cloud, 
Uh, the clouds are a big box of labels. You have instances, you have other services, you have like queue services, you have a big bunch of stuff. And the thing is that uh, lots of people say, okay, right now in my physical data center, I have this type of queue, this type of box, this big, uh, this big database with trillions of IOPS. And in the cloud, I don't have one like that. So I can't go to the cloud because the cloud pieces don't fit me. So first take, don't fear constraints. That big data bo uh, the database box can be split into three, four databases. It's the same cost, really. It can be even uh, smaller because normally in the, in, in, in the physical data center, in traditional data center, we have our boxes over provisioned to a level that we don't even know. So normally right sizing every database, for example, will, will, uh, will get you there. So, uh, and if you're afraid, Look at this. So, this is a jet engine, a uh, jet fan engine that's built of Legos. Standard building blocks can do amazing stuff. And of course, as, the, as time goes on, clouds will come up with pieces that will fit you better. But of course, there's, there's always the thing, of, should I wait or should I not wait? Uh, th that's just like in summer, the, the, pool, the, the, the pool is too cold and you never, you never jump in. So just jump in and the, the, the attitude that you have to have versus the cloud is this one. So more things that uh, come in handy when we talk about cloud or migrating to cloud or deploying applications in cloud is security. So uh, Lord of the Rings fans, these are the black gates of Mordor. Uh, sorry if I'm being imprecise, maybe they have another name, but <laughs> if you're a big fan of walking movies, so just tell me the real name. Um, the thing is that our cloud is the biggest data center you can imagine. Data center? No, data centers all around the world. So uh, we really have an un unlimited amount of capacity and we have to think securely about it because if we, if we do it incorrectly, uh, we'll, we'll get into trouble because Basically, we're giving away the keys to the biggest data center in the world. So uh, when we're designing, don't let security be uh, an afterthought. Think about security in the first place. And, don't, and please do think that cloud providers are giving you the tools to embrace that security uh, so, so please inform yourself and, uh, really, and really take this into account in the first place. Don't think, okay, I'll just do this whatever way and, and then, I'll, then I'll think about security because then your keys, maybe your keys to the data center, you're giving them away to people that shouldn't have them, okay? And once you have a, the biggest data center in the world and I give you away my keys to it, you can do whatever you want, okay? So think about that. More stuff, automation. Automation is, is also an afterthought uh, most of the time. If you, if you operate from the core, try to automate everything, uh, you, you'll be able to embrace best practices. So uh, the thing is that the, in the traditional data center, we're accustomed to getting a new server, cute, cuddly thing. We give, him, we give it a name. 
So uh, mittens, we, as time goes on, we show it to do tricks, neat tricks, uh, but the inevitable does happen. Someday it will go away. And we're sad about that. The thing is that reproducing that pet, we call traditional servers. We, there's an, uh, an analogy about pets and cattle. Old, old traditional infrastructure, we call them pets because we did that with them. We started vanilla and we showed them to do the tricks. In the cloud and in traditional data center, you can apply this too. You want to automate, so you really have cattle. And I'm sorry, vegetarians in the room, I have a better, um, a, a better metaphor for that. So pets versus cattle go away. Let's try with plants versus crops. <laughs> so uh, that's the metaphor where, uh, so really if this guy goes away, th they're all the same. They're just built with one thing in mind, consuming them for us to, for them to do a service, okay? So, uh, and this is only done via automation. More stuff you'll be, you'll be seeing. I, I've seen lots of talks about continuous integration and continuous deployment. The thing is that why do we do continuous integration? Or why do we want to do it? What's, what's the, the reason behind that? Continuous integration, look at your code and your code repository as a big warehouse. Every time you commit, these are your commits. When a comet is not in production, it's just lying around doing nothing, doing no service. So pushing, pushing code to a repository is really, is, and without it being in production, without it in the hands of our customers, delivers zero value. You can be the best programmer in the world and you can check out millions of lines per day. Uh, of course, a good programmer doesn't do millions of lines per day. Okay, just uh, so uh, a fair amount of code per day. But if you don't get that code in the hands of your users, it has zero value. So the thing about continuous integration is trying to know if you can put the code in the hands of your, of your customers. So and how do we do that? checking every unit that you pass through the line, you, you want to check it, and you want to say, go, no go. So you have better control over when that code can be put in the hands of your customer. And of course, once, if we have the appropriate um, amount of tests, will be very confident that once our continuous integration says, okay, we can go and deploy. Just push a button and deploy because remember, we're automating everything. Continuous uh, integration should be automated too. So acceptance tests, user tests, maybe you want some type of manual process. It depends on the organization, but the, uh, the, that verifies uh, a release. But the thing is that at the end, you want to know continuously, go, no go. Why? Because really we're accustomed to big, big, big releases. So shipping software these days or, or in the olden days is like this, a big release. And when we deploy it, it's like, <laughs> we did it. Um, of course, this is a big effort, and this is time. We can change that. We can change that to deliver small packages. So think that if the tests pass, 
and the tests give you the confidence that that code can go into production, just put it in there. So pl please don't, uh, ops guys, please don't tell a developer that to put a CSS into production that corrects a bug, you will be two weeks. Because this sometimes happens in the, really? This has to change. So more stuff, more stuff about, as you see, for the moment, zero tools. <laughs> Uh, choose, choose your own venom, really. Uh, there's lots of tools that cover these points. I want to get across why we use the tools <coughs> or really the benefits of using them because using tools randomly won't get you anywhere. So, uh, of course, more things about the cloud. Uh, depending on how you operate your cloud, you can end up with an architecture like this. Top Gear fans, this was, the, this, this was their take on building a car. How hard can it be? So, uh, but of course, with the cloud, you can build this. The best car you can make. Uh, but of course, the thing is that time goes by. And this is this, is this year's Ferrari, Formula One car. This is 2000-ish. And do, do you see that the, there are changes? Alerons, aerodynamics, this thing has little bits everywhere. This guy is simpler. Time will go by and this is a 1990s Formula One car. The thing is, your infrastructure or your cloud or your application will get oldish because time passes. And, but that doesn't mean that these things couldn't do very incredible stuff. But of course, there is some time where uh, this seems a bit old, too old. So we, the, the cloud really uh, lets us embrace the concept of changing things constantly and not paying the price of, of changing. Because when you throw away a server, you stop paying for it. So we, have, we, we can embrace the malleability of the cloud to adapt it every step along the way. More stuff, uh, the cost of failure. So failure, everyone will fail sometime. I remember the day I rm'd dot rf slash a server. <laughs> uh, has anyone failed in this room? Okay. Thing is, uh, if you fail and you get yelled at, you'll stop trying. So, we have to design thinking of lowering the cost of failure. So just saying, okay, you can fail, it's controlled, you can roll back. In a controlled and not time-consuming manner. So that's a bit about changes to people. Find the people that embrace this type of culture and you will be able to embrace DevOps. So l let's see what we can do with our processes. So. Process level, best practices really for cloud. Best practices are like this. So don't get eaten by the Velociraptor. So I'll just take this shortcut. Oh! First, designing for failure. We'll talk about failure a bit more. Um, everyone thinks the cloud is biggest thing since, <laughs> since ever, and 
thinks KCB really thinks it's a small box over there. And but think about this: it's so, there's only one cord, so if someone trips on it, your cloud will go down someday. So you have to design for when that happens. Think of this thing. What happens if a uh, if um, a wheel gets punctured? Nothing. So uh, let's let's see how we can design for failure. And I love this chart. Uh, it's 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 talking about where we have to focus for failure because uh, we tend to get obsessed. Ops people tend to get obsessed more than software people in, in making everything making everything redundant. And maybe you have the smallest application in the world. And maybe dev people are, are saying, okay, you have to provide me with a very reliable service. And we have to take this on a, an organizational level and, and, and say, okay, where are we? Because if we're, if we take the rate of change in hardware, how many boxes we're pulling in and pulling out and growing and how many we have, and the rate of change in software, how many times I put stuff into production. If we have only one server and the software that gets deployed one time in its life, the state of that service what do you think will be? It will tend to work because one server can be alive for a lot of time. You can, you can perfectly have a server on three, four years without any type of problem. And of course you have to plan for if that server dies, but your service will tend to work. If we start throwing hardware in, more hardware, more hardware, more hardware, and we only deploy one time in our life, same application always, what will tend to fail? Hardware. So we have to take care of hardware failures. How, how will we cope with that? But the thing that we don't think about normally is, I'll push 400 times to production this year. That means one push to production every year. Uh, sorry, every day. When that happens and you really have just one box where you push code to, what will make you fail? The software. So think about making this resilient or, or easy for it to fail and roll back. If you try to solve this problem with the techniques that you use for hardware, you're fried, you won't go anywhere. And of course, at scale, when you deploy lots of times and you have lots of hardware. So a good example of this is Netflix. They have lots of servers, they deploy lots of times per day and they know they have to embrace failure and so they make their things fail all the time because they know that failures happen in the worst moment so they really want to exercise they want to be failing constantly because if you fail constantly then eventually nothing fails you'll be prepared so uh, this is the chaos monkey they did since they are using a public cloud they just made a program that will go around shooting servers and changing security groups and changing your firewalls, deleting load balancers, causing chaos. And their software and their infrastructure has to embrace these types of failure. And uh, they, they go even one step more. They create the Simian army. Uh, with monkeys that will, for example, the, where is he, the janitor monkey. When they detect that people uh, do uncompliant things in their cloud, because maybe instead
instances have to be tagged and have to be able to know who is their uh, their um, owner, this guy will just boom, shoot him. Sorry, why did you do an, an, an uncompliant thing? Uh, more stuff like um, there is a janitor monkey, a sig uh, sorry, uh, conformance monkey was the one that uh, deleted stuff that wasn't conformant. Uh, janitor monkey tries to send mails to people saying, okay, you have underutilized resources. Do you really want to? Maybe you can delete that, please. So, okay, so we're making infrastructure fail. We have to, de de to design our software so when that infrastructure fails, we can support the failure. So how do we do that? Well, there, there are patterns for that. And one is called a circuit breaker. So, because there's no type of, uh, when the service fails, you want to stop passing it because a service may fail because maybe it's mm, overloaded. So if a service is overloaded, do you think that yelling at it harder will make it work better? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so really, you have to back off. How do we back off? Linearly, exponentially? It's exponential with jitter, so we don't align all, all of the retries. There's lots of techniques, but the thing is, and you can shut off the service, and that's it. Because um, these guys have one thing in their head. Their mission is to let you play videos. If an internal service, like for example, a recommendation service fails, th they have, they, they, they know that that can't happen. That stops their mission being for you guys to be able to play a video. So they do everything they can to let you play the video. And they'll go to lengths to hard code responses in the code, if I can't get to a service, let's just hard code the standard response. And of course, the, the software, is uh, that's part of the development process too. And the thing is that uh, since we are trying to design a small container, uh, small services that are independent of each other, uh, the thing is that these services can evolve on their own. So that's the, the microservice concept. S small um, independent services. And the thing is that you always want the, fur the, the, the last version of your service, the, the one that best does its job. But of course, the new guy in town is not that tested as other versions so you can have a backup strategy for that you can say okay this guy for example a recommendation system I have the version 1000 is what's in production and it starts to get overloaded so you can have a plan B I know that I have a another version it's a bit older it recommends a bit it's, it's not that good recommending, but it recommends, so I put that one in production. And of course, and if the load is too heavy and maybe you have a version that you know that is not as good, but can handle lots and lots and lots of load, you go to your old warhorse and you put that in production. So, uh, and this is, this is quite difficult. The thing is that uh, clouds are programmable data centers. So uh, you can program your infrastructure. So put this into production can be just execute this script. Uh, and infrastructure can be treated, the whole infrastructure can be treated as code too. Because how many of you guys have a NAD, a network diagram for their 
infrastructure, no network diagrams. I've had network diagrams. Don't be shy. No. The, the thing with documentation is that uh, in as just as you finish your documentation in the cloud, it's obsolete. Something has changed. So what if we treat infrastructure as code and there there are techniques for that where you can declare your infrastructure give it to your cloud provider and just let it deploy let let it create the infrastructure um, if you do that you can version your infrastructure with your code so this is the infrastructure that was needed to run this service and you can version it all along so this unlocks the metrics so once you do this you start to see everything in a different perspective more patterns scaling horizontally so uh, this is an anti-pattern because when we start to scale horizontally okay I have more load more users I put in a bigger box and then more users and more users. I put in an even bigger box and one day I get to the biggest box possible. And uh, not all software tolerates putting bigger boxes in there to, 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 to just handle more users. There are bottlenecks. So uh, think about that too. A good pattern, I'm not saying it's the easiest thing to do, but if you follow some of the advice here, it's easier. Uh, one pattern is just scaling horizontally. We put more machines and more machines and more machines in there. This can scale infinitely or unlimitedly. But to do that, of course, think about automation, think about the other stuff we've been talking, uh, talking about. And uh, one thing to scale horizontally efficiently is immutability. So having lots and lots and lots of servers or instances, we'll call them, uh, you, you want to have all of your instances uh, the same, and you want to also be able to recall the, the, um, the old guys. So the thing is that from this mold I can make new uh, statues and um, the thing is that when we're managing this many servers and there's a problem in one or two or in the service should we log into these servers to see what's happening I, I defy you to open 100 SSHs to your boxes you, you won't see what's happening so the thing is that immutability talks about just two operations for your service, uh, for your servers. Start and destroy. That's all. There are people that say, don't even run an SSH on your boxes. And you say, that's like suicidal. Okay, maybe we can run SSH just in case. But the thing is that it's just in case. Uh, where do we send our metrics, our statistics, our logs to some central place where we can, where we can manage them? Because really having to log into, I don't know how many boxes, is a real pain and it's, it's really not operative. So uh, try to get to this point. It's, n it's not easy, it's a, it's a process and it's iterative and don't worry. You'll get better at it every time. More stuff, more stuff. Yeah, loose coupling. Uh, we try to take care of code. Yeah, we try. Okay, don't don't do spaghetti code. So why do we do spaghetti data centers? And of course, maybe your data center is perfectly cabled, but you have a spaghetti infrastructure. Uh, it, it's the same. Please think about this. Some ways to decouple components is maybe to put a load balancer in front of a service 
So the thing is that the people that consume this service, if the, all these servers are doing, or, or maybe serving a web page, the thing is, or, or, or an internal service, our recommendation service, the software that consumes this service only has to know about one endpoint. And it doesn't matter how big or small or what type of servers you're using here. This service can evolve independ independently of the others. So it makes your life easier. So wh when you say I have to deploy on <coughs> maybe this service, you start looking at dependencies, whoa, I have to shut down the, the, the entire thing. Okay, put in a queue, send stuff to a queue. Uh, that you only have to know one endpoint, the queue. And then if you have hundreds of servers, no problem. Okay, another thing to do is, this is the typical parallelism problem. <laughs> The thing is that uh, in the cloud, if we think parallel, we can, we, we can do neat stuff. Because do you know that 100 hours of one server costs the same as 100 servers for one hour? The only change is in the latency of your response. So think about parallelizing, think about doing this, letting processors do stuff in parallel. More stuff, we don't want to have state. What happens if this little guy, sorry guy, blo gets blown away? We don't have the same picture. So uh, we've lost something. So state on servers is you want the state far away in services that are built to handle the state and if, for example, on your application servers, you take temporary files, sessions, you push them to other services that handle that stuff, suddenly you can just blow any, any server away and the server, the service keeps working and your customers don't even know what, that anything happened. And that has one uh, big advantage in the cloud, that you can implement this, elasticity. Now I can go bigger and go smaller in function of my traffic, of my load. I can put more servers in and I can take servers out as my users are coming in. I'm adapting to them and that uh, don't is is a is a quite a cost reduction normally, because just think that your normal traffic patterns go like this. So, if you're dimensioned to be over here, all the area below the 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 demand curve is just stuff is is just computation you're throwing away. So if you can adapt your infrastructure to the load you're having, you're really saving costs. And that can go easily from 25% to 75% or 50%, okay? So, just a, just a, a quick uh, recap of, uh, of, of the cloud best practices. We've seen the people part, we've seen the process part, is there a tools part in this? Nope. We're over. So, almost over. <laughs> so, thanks. Thanks for attending. So, questions? And I won't eat you. I don't bite. Okay, so.